Good afternoon and welcome to the August 2nd meeting of Glendale Housing Authority. May we have the roll call, please? Authority members Devine? Here. Friedman? Here. Garpedian? Here. Kelly? Here. Najarian? Here. Razian? Here. Chair Sinanian? Here. Next item, please. Report of the clerk is that the agenda for the August 2nd, 2016 regular meeting of the Glendale Housing Authority was posted on Friday, July 29, 2016 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. The next item is the approval of minutes for meetings of July 19th, 26. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. No objections. Without objections, the minutes are approved as submitted. <clears throat> next item, please. This item is oral communications, and I don't believe there were cards submitted for general oral communications. Okay, let's go to the business agenda then. 6A is Director of Community Development regarding selection of either Link Housing Corps or Thomas Saffron and Associates as the Affordable Senior Housing Development Team and proposal for Housing Authority-owned property at 5th Street and Sonora Avenue in response to the Housing Authority's request for proposals. This was continued from July 26, 2016. 6A1 is Housing Authority motion to select either Link Housing Corps or Thomas Saffron and Associates as the Development Team and proposal for an affordable senior housing development on the Housing Authority-owned property at 5th Street and Sonora Avenue and authorization for the executive director to negotiate and enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, as I stated last time, I have a conflict in this matter uh, based on a, a contribution and I'm going to recuse myself. Very well. And I'll step in the back and if someone can just let me know like, when it's safe to come back. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. It's safe. Uh, Mr. Chair, Chair um, last week, I recused myself uh, from hearing the presentations because I had a, uh, looking back 12 months, there was one of the uh, applicants who had made a, a contribution to my uh, supervisorial campaign. Uh, as it stands today, uh, with the two that are before us, um, the uh, my 12-month window, looking backwards, is free from any contributions from any of these two uh, applicants. So, uh, upon my understanding of the law, as explained to me by the city attorney, uh, I uh, am not conflicted out, and so I would be remaining uh, on the dais for the discussion. Okay, very well. So how do we do this? Uh, yes, Mr. Ochoa. If we could, just uh, by way of uh, framing up this issue, we've come to the, hopefully, presumably, the conclusion of this odyssey of a project that's been uh, nearly a decade in the making, and you heard uh, from uh, the <coughs> proponents two weeks, or uh, a week ago, that's gone by further than that. Uh, after that number was called down from a list of 18 to a list of six, down to three, back to five, and at your last discussion and deliberation, uh, the Housing Authority Board brought it down to a final two, as was read by Mr. Kasakian, the uh, folks at Tom Saffron Associates and the folks at uh, Link Housing. So uh, we have for you, um, as you know, uh, Mr. Chair, there are a number of cards, people wanting to speak to you, but at this point, it really is a function of council deliberation. Certainly, you'll take that, that public comment under advisement. Um, but I would just leave you with one note, uh, some information that you have in front of you on the dais. There was some discussion last week about open space and trying to do an apples to apples comparison on open space and how open space was termed, if it was plaza space or green parking space or whatever the case might be. And so to the credit of, of both TSA and LINK, our staff was able to work with them and they have committed to the, uh, the figures that you have on that form before you. This information uh, should not be too uh, terribly different from what you've seen in the past. There are some clarifications, but at the end of the day, what you see there on top is Link Core, uh, their 65 unit proposal, public private uh, community room. It's a private community room that can be used as public uh, for programming and what have you at 3,500 square feet. And the total outdoor space, this is everything that isn't parking, that isn't building footprint. Uh, the, this is area that is uh, landscaped and or available for folks to utilize. 
Um, same, by the same token, Tom Saffron Associates with a 70 unit proposal uh, bringing a nearly 1,000 square foot com public community room, uh, the 2,350 uh, private community room, and total outdoor space under those same terms and definitions of 27,432. As you see, it's made up of the, the uh, open space and landscape area as well as uh, the community space, uh, park space that, that's listed there at 6,099 square feet. I'd be remiss if I didn't call out that the link uh, submission was uh, outdoor space and landscape at 23052 uh, and the resident gardens, uh, the, the uh, planting beds at uh, 1634. Uh, so this information, more clarification than anything else, but again, the goal is to give you that apples to apples. I would submit to you that at this point you are blessed and lucky to have uh, the final two developers who really cannot go wrong. You are going to get an outstanding project no matter what you end up doing uh, today uh, with these two development firms. No disrespect to any of the other firms that submitted, but I think when you look at the quality, the track record, um, and actually there's something very similar about all of the, the both of these proposals uh, that I don't think you can make a mistake. You should have some comfort uh, in that. And so uh, with that being kind of the framework for these discussions, sir, you probably would want to uh, hear from the public as my guest before you deliberate. Okay, okay Mr. Nigerian. Um, <clears throat> to, be, to be fair to staff and to the city manager, um, and because I was not here last week, uh, I felt that the discussion of these projects went off track. I believe that the most important factor that we as a housing authority need to uh, consider and analyze is the success of the applicant obtaining the 9% tax credit allocation, the discussion of design, the discussion of color, materials, whether there's a trail around the building, whether there's a wall, whether there's a community garden, whether there's a 1,000-foot community room or 3,000-foot community room uh, is not important at this point. It's not important because we are not picking a design. We are picking an applicant with whom we will be entering into an ENA process where we will be sitting down and all the things that we like or dislike from the other projects can be placed in their design team's hands and worked on it. I like the, uh, I like the open space. I like the large room. I like the solar panels. Uh, I like the community gardens. I like the color of this, the style of that. We can put that all before us. And we were sitting around arguing about these issues, which was we were completely off track. What we needed to focus on was the uh, probable success of that applicant in obtaining the 9% tax credits. And there were some questions asked about that, but the answers we got were not clear, they were very broad, and they could have been, uh, although telling the truth, not specific enough. So I have a motion, which is alternative three, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, that staff come back to us with specific answers to each of these questions. And I have some questions. I have them printed out so there's no confusion. Uh, and I'm going to distribute them. <clears throat> So let me read this out loud into the record. The questions for all applicants. I'm going to request that every single applicant uh, out of the five uh, come and give us these answers. And whether they're done under the, uh, the penalty of perjury uh, or whatever, I need a specific answer to these. Since 2011, how many 9% California tax credit allocations have you received in which, one, you were the stated developer in the CTCAC application. Two, you did not have a for-profit partner. Three, the project was not special needs or SRO. 
Four, the TCAC application was prepared by your firm and paid for 100% by you. And five, the project was a new development. So I want to know that. There were some general, you know, we got 15 out of 17. And in the last three months, we got nine out of 10. And I want to know specifically with these, because uh, these applicants are going to be flying on their own. They're going to be the lead for this. And the fact that they were a uh, minority partner or did some small project that received a TCAC, for me, doesn't prove that they're uh, have the ability to be successful in receiving them. I think it's only fair for the authority to get this information and then go forward. And I don't want to talk about design. Design is irrelevant at this point. Design can be changed. Uh, it's got to go through design review board anyway on top of all, all this. Um, and the report states that we, as an authority, can have input into that design even before it gets to the design review. So we were looking at the wrong thing. We were looking at the nice, shiny building with we've got this and we've got that. That's not what we're here for. We're here to have a, we're here to have a successful project at the very next ta uh, tax credit application uh, issuance, and that's what we should be focusing on. And that's my motion. Um, and I don't know if anyone... You know, I know this is out of left field, but I was excluded last week, and I would have said this last week, too, had I been permitted to speak. Um, but I think this is very important, and I wasn't happy with the answers that we got from staff or from the applicants. They were not specific. They were not precise. They were very general, although not, uh, I'm not characterizing them as being uh, untruthful, but they were very uh, wishy-washy and not specific enough for this housing authority member. And I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but that's where I'm at. Authority member Garpetti wants to add something. But I, honestly, I thought when we pressed each applicant last week specifically on the issue of how many 9% tax credit applications they've, they've had approved in the last five years, I thought these were the straight answers we were getting. From your questions, I'm understanding that you're implying that that information may not have been exactly um, on point. Am I correct in understanding that? I'm correct. We are not experts in the, in the sure. process. And it is a very complicated process. And we should have been, I think, informed either from the applicant or from staff that although it may be truthful to say that in the last 17 applications you got 15 of them, what was your role in those 15 or those 17? Were you the lead agency? Did you have a nonprofit partner? Uh, was it not special needs? Uh, was it a new development? These are all things that we needed to know. And this is a very complicated and complex uh, public financing uh, mechanism, vehicle that is being used here. And, you know, the more I dug into it, this is what I, I think I want the answers to. Um, um, sure, Madam Mayor, but oh. Authority Member Garpet, you wanted to go, but you, you can go first. That's fine. Yeah. I, I just wanted to know, are these not questions that staff looks into before they vet or as they're vetting, or are these like over the top? I'm sure these, these questions are fine. They, they're fine questions. I think to the extent that um, the resumes presented to you by TSA, by Link, as an example, because those are the two finalists that are here, do stand up to, to scrutiny, scrutiny and comparative analysis to the extent that TCAC is, is complex. But it's, it isn't complex for people that do it on a pretty regular basis and do it with a tremendous amount of success. Um, if we are going to look back at the last uh, you know, 24 years uh, and try to understand who has had the greatest amount of success, arguably uh, successful applications from 24 years ago may not be as telling as success in the last five years or 10 years because the economy changes, uh, the system changes, the demands and tastes of renters change. And so I think you have to look at it, a continu at, at, look at it as a continuum. To the extent, and, and certainly with, with respect to, to Mr. Uh, Najarian, I think when you compare the bona fides of the proponents um, and, and, and understand that they all can play, they really can, then it starts to get into, and I think this is where the council was or the housing authority buzz was last week, all things being equal, if all these folks really can play, 
what starts to separate them from one from another? It's like a job interview. And you get to a point saying, okay, do you have that bachelor's degree? Yep. Do you have that master's degree? Okay, tell me about your experience. Pretty soon you start getting down into levels of, uh, of subjectivity, about experience, where somebody went to school, what color tie they may be wearing, because you're trying to find something that separates people apart. As I mentioned at the beginning, you have here, interestingly enough, proposals that are very similar to one another. You have developers that have been very successful recently, as other developers have. And so when you consider those together and you look at, okay, well, now let's look at, the, let's look at the design. Let's look at the vision. I think what you have here is probably those two best developers. Last week we had one developer who has since submitted a letter that I would argue kind of mailed in their proposal. Uh, it, the, the, it, it, ascribing it to, well, things are going to change anyway, so why even put paper to pencil, generally speaking, because it's going to change anyway by way of the Design Review Board, Planning Commission, whatever the case is. That is possible, most certainly. In some cases, maybe even likely. But this Housing Authority Board set out an RFP that evaluated those criteria. And so, again, with, with, uh, with a great deal of respect for Mr. Najarian, I would submit to you that you have an opportunity you, to interview all of these folks. You did. You had the top six. You had the top five. There is a process that is underway. And I think that's been a good process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ochoa. Mr. Garpetian? Yes, I, I don't think uh, Mr. Najarian's comments today is uh, too off the wall because this is what I've been asking for the last two, three weeks. And I didn't get a straight answer, to be honest with you. All the, the, the details that he is indicating here today, I think this will get to the uh, bottom of the question that I had as to who can get that 9% tax credit on the first round. And I can be a developer, but team up with another developer who has more experience, and I'll be 2%, and the other one is 98%, and we get a project done, and I can take credit for that. I think there are a lot of uh, moving parts that we need to look at. As well as the cost of development, I asked this last time, the cost of development and the number of units will make it uh, a big difference at the end as to who can get that 9% tax credit because if the city subsidy is the same and the cost of your development is less than mine, you have a better chance of getting that 9% tax credit when the number of units are the same or number of bedrooms are the same. So these are the things we need to look at also. Uh, if I'm building 50 units and my square footage is 12,000 square foot more than you, uh, at the end, I think we need to, I don't have a problem looking at this thing and getting all the information back for another week or two uh, because this is an important project and I personally voiced my opinion from the very first day as to who can get this project done. The design can be changed, the amount of park space can be changed, the number of bedrooms can be changed. Uh, all of that can be can be worked out, but if you can't get that first round tax credit, uh, then we are with the with the with the we, we met with the, our uh, lobbies today, and there are so many things coming up that we don't know if these tax credits are going to be there, going to be more or going to be less. So I, I think we need to look into this and uh, make sure that the developer that we choose is the one that can has the experience of getting that nine percent tax credit. If I, I, yes, just, just Mr. Trump. very short and, and again very respectfully, to the extent that the Housing Authority Board certainly is the policy-making body, the goal for you is to make policy. You have had a great deal of staff time vetting through these and many other issues by folks on your team, on your staff, that have been responsible for bringing you projects that are even more complex than this. And after their review of the RFP, putting it together, getting your insight as to what you wanted to see in the RFP, bringing back the 18 uh, proposals, calling that down to the six, getting down to the three, and now the two, the, the considered opinion of your staff that has done this on numerous projects and numerous uh, contexts is telling you, recommending to you without any reservation whatsoever, that you have two outstanding. You had three, um, now we had five, and now we're back to two, and you can't make a mistake. These two firms will be able to perform for you in, in the TCAC process. Certainly not any less than any of the other firms that were out there in the process. Well, here, here's one of my Tim issues. Um, when I first went through these applications with staff, the probability of success of any of the developers and applicants was not even part of our discussion. 
It was look at the pretty pictures. And I like looking at pretty pictures. And if we were picking one and saying this is a final approval, I'd say that's very important. But it's not important at this stage since this is going to be an exclusive negotiation <laughs> agreement. And what, pray tell, should the Housing Authority do if it's determined that the success on getting the 9% tax credits was overstated by any one of the applicants? I'm not saying there's any untruths, but overstated. Uh, should that not cause us uh, some pause to some pause in the analysis of the applications. And I'm not saying that's the case, but the problem is that these specific, the answer to these specific questions were not given to the authority. We've heard they're all in the game. They're all players. They're all, they're all in it. Well, I would like to know how well they're in it. I'm looking, I'm looking for someone to fill the fourth spot in my batting lineup. And I want to know, is he batting 400 or is he batting 200? And is he a home run hitter, or does he hit singles, or does he whiff? Can he hit a left-hander, or can he hit a right-hander? This is what I want to know, and this is the important thing for me. I would submit to you, without any disrespect to the folks from Link, and just because we haven't had the, op the opportunity to work together, you can say, you can look at the folks from TSA and say they have hit that home run. And further... The there is uh, it's probably easier to get those nine percent TCAC than to hit a ninety mile an hour fastball, <laughs> and so the, the folks at Link they can play. Just it's not a platitude. They have that demonstrated experience. Ultimately, the Housing Authority Board makes process, and I'll shut up after this. I would submit to you submit to you though that you have a process. We followed that process through good faith with trained staff that know what they're looking for, and you got you got an amazing field of uh, developers, private sector partners, and non-governmental uh, non organizations that want to that partner with you. It, it, I caution you about subverting that process at this 11th hour. Comment. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, and speaking to the success rate of, uh, of getting that 9%, uh, our two finalists have like a 90% success rate and um, I don't know that we could get any better than that. But that's that. what's being questioned. Exactly. Yeah. My, my concern know, is have, that's what's but being that, questioned. But that's what I'm saying, though. But we have two finalists who have, who have a tremendous uh, success rate. Uh, 18, what is it? Saffron has 18 out of 19. And uh, Link has 20 out of 21, let's say. So their success rate, both of these um, uh, companies have ter tremendous success rates. I don't know why we're questioning if, if, that. If I understand Authority Member Nigerian's questions correctly or his motivation correctly, he's questioning whether indeed each one of the applicants does have the success rate that they allege they have. And the, the reason for the questioning is that they may have been a partner or a junior partner in an application as opposed to them themselves authoring the application. My, my my understanding. That's what I'm talking about. That's so. That's what that's what the issue is. Uh, Mr. Ocho, can I ask you a question? If it, so, if you answer these questions for the five, does it mean you have to answer the question for the eighteen? Um. Well, that's not my motion. Well, well I understand. I, I still want to know, but I, I would have to defer to city attorney because if somehow these criteria took on added weight in the evaluation and were not listed in the RFP on the front end, arguably, and, and I'll just play the attorney for a second, but certainly I'll uh, defer to Jillian, arguably somebody who came in 18th could say, well, I do something extraordinarily well. My design may have been terrible. I may have uh, uh, proposed 200 units for a site that couldn't take 200 units, but I, I bat 1,000 when it comes to getting 9% tax credits. And you don't know that because they didn't make it past that first six. Well, let, let me ask my question a different way. Was the applicant's ability to successfully compete for 9% California tax credit allocation a criteria of their application? That was a, a, a criteria in selecting them for the final round, yes. Okay, so it was. I, I'm, I'm okay with that then. Um, 
I don't know, should we open this for public hearing and then, or do we have a motion? We have a motion, we don't have a second though, so. I'll second the motion. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, are you seconding it or not seconding? I'll second, but how, for how long? That's, that's, that's the key. Two weeks, I that's think. Two weeks is plenty of time for, for uh, the, staff to respond to these questions. And is this for the top, top two? Five. The top two. Five. Why five? Oh, we've, because already, we've already narrowed it down to two. Yeah, but based on, criteria. based according to Nigerian, uh, authority member Nigerian, it was not necessarily on information that we were give, Well, I mean, again, that's what he's saying. I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, my motion is to bring it to the top five. Uh, and I don't want staff to answer these questions. I want the applicants to answer these questions. So let me save staff some work and we can pass this out to the applicants and they can respond to it. And I want a signature by the applicant uh, at the bottom of it. Yeah, but staff would have to confirm it or double check. Staff can Otherwise confirm it's an exercise in And, and uh, you know, all the other representations were made on tape as well. So those representations, whether it's puffery or whether it's braggadocia or whether it's whatever, is on there. So I really want to see how their signed answers match what their representations were to the authority. I hope they're the same, obviously, but uh, I want to nail it down. I don't want any wiggle room. It might help. We're prepared to answer that question right now. I'm sorry. No. No, I, think we, I think we need to give a fair chance to everyone to come back with the, with the answers, not just the one on the spot right now. Okay, well, I think this is an important enough issue to kick this by two weeks and get certain answers. I, I get a feeling that the results we're going to get are not going to be very different, so nothing. I mean, can, can, can staff process this in two weeks, get the answers and confirm? We, yes, we can do whatever the uh, board wants. Two weeks, or you, can you do it in a week? Uh, if that's the board's choosing. This is pretty elemental stuff, so. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, do you want to uh, vote motion? on the motion? Yes. It, there were some modifications or further specifications made by uh, yes. authority member Najarian, so, or just have it be direction to staff. It's discretion. We have a motion in a second. So we don't even need to vote on this? Can be direction to staff? My suggestion would be that you do consider Take a vote. motion. Okay. Well, we have for two weeks. I will uh, give the applicants uh, sufficient time so that they're not rushed and that the answers they give us are absolutely correct. Uh, I think two weeks should be sufficient. But they're hearing that... Uh, this is not going to be here in two weeks. When will you be here? Three weeks. Three weeks. Three, three weeks. One week, one week or three weeks. Uh, amend your motion. One week is five questions. Uh, uh, I don't have a problem with three weeks to make sure everyone has the time to respond and be present as well. How about one week? I won't be here. Will you be here in a week? I won't be here. Let's do, let's, please amend it to a week. Uh, I will amend my request to return in one week. Uh, with the questions to these answers by all five applicants. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? <clears throat> Authority members Devine? No. Friedman? Garpedian? Yes. Kelly? No. Najarian? Yes. Razian? Yes. Chair Sinanian? Yes. So I have uh, speaking cards, but I'm not sure that there's a need to open the public hearing at this point. Why don't we do that next week? Can we do that? I, item is on the agenda, and oh, if, are... okay, fine. If if those that still want to speak, come on down. I'll, I'll call the names one by one. Sid Pinedo, I'm opening the public hearing. Sid Pinedo, there's no hearing. No, no, I'll wait until next week. Okay, Byron Eli, next week. Okay, thank you, Beverly Smith. Thank you, Jan Stevens. Thank you, Esther Solar. Thank you, uh, Andrew Gross. I think you said next week. Thank you, Jesus Armas. Next week is fine. Next week, thank you, Mr. Armas, and Suni Lei Chang. Next week, thank you. I think um, I'd like to make one comment. 
There's you have three minutes. Speak. Well, I guess you want to exercise your right to speak. You did have a card, so why don't you speak? How much time do you need? Three minutes? Just a minute. I'm sure it's just fine. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Honorable afternoon. members of the Housing Authority. I just, just, I'm here, so I might as well speak. I just want to also, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying. Respectfully, um, I just want to be mindful that the 18 people who did submit for this RFP put a tremendous, tremendous amount of work into the vision and the design of what we propose to you. So I would urge you not to discount that. Yes, we can change things with input, um, but we really all put an incredible, over the holidays it really was, amount of time into the design of the vision we presented to you. So I would really urge you not to discount that. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, OK, you had a card, too, so why don't you, Sunile Chang. Thank, thank you. you. And, and actually, what I do want to speak to is this state, question. State your name for the Sunile record. Sunile Chang with Link Housing. Uh, I do want to speak to this question about the number of tax credit projects and who's done what and how many. I, I will say we are the nonprofit developer here. Partnership is not necessarily a bad thing because it brings together strengths that different partners bring together. That is the benefit of the core link relationship. I will also tell you that we stand individually when you evaluate us in terms of our benefits and the, the types of tax credit deals that we have done. And I can tell you, um, just for the record, we did submit to staff a complete list of all of our projects by name, by year, by project type. And it includes also Tom Safran's projects. We also included the link that this came from. This came from the, the California TCAC link. It is publicly available, which is why it is completely unbiased and anyone can pull it. It is all there and it stands alone. And you can see that link stands alone, core stands alone as their own developers. Is and that in our packet? Uh, I don't believe it is. Yeah. Oh. In the state. Oh, it is. Okay. In the state of California, in order for a tax credit developer to a tax credit project to re a, receive a welfare exemption, a property tax abatement on its taxes, it must partner with a nonprofit. There is no other alternative. So that's how we end up with some of these, but we are also developers in our own right. Tom Safran will have to partner with a nonprofit developer. That's just the way the numbers work. And so I don't want our credibility, our development reputation to be obfuscated by the fact that we partner with others. It's the way the rules are written. And I will say that you can look at the results of our analysis, how much we have done, what we have done individually, and see that we are all players in our own right. I, and as Mr. Ochoa has said multiple times, um, if we, you are looking at two really good developers, and if we were to lose to Tom Safran, I would say that we lost to a good team. And I would hope they would say the same of us. Thank you. And um, I do agree with Mr. Gross. They, you guys have done a superb job in terms of the actual, the, the total, so the uh, aesthetic aspect of the project. No doubt about it. Um, so those are all the, all the, you know, I have more cards on this item, but I, I have a certain feeling that they have nothing to do with this project. But I'm going to invite you up to speak. This is for oral communications, which actually we okay. believe. It says 6A on it. That's why most of them. So, okay, we'll keep it for oral communications. Thank you. I'm going to close the, the public hearing. and uh, It was not a hearing. It was not a hearing. Okay. Um, so that's it. Whoever was here on that item, 6A. Huh? No, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now you just, we have to go back to oral okay. communications if you'd like to take those Okay, cards, I would like to sure. take their cards, yes. So next item, Mr. Clerk. Next time would be oral communications, if you wish to reopen that. Yes, I would like to reopen oral communications, and we will start with um, Anna Avakian. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Avakian, a citizen of Glendale. Can we have some, some quiet, please, in the chambers? I'm sorry. That's okay. Second. How much time do you need, Ms. Avakin? Probably three, five minutes. It's more than enough for me. Okay, five minutes. What I'm going to talk about the issue regarding to homeland Armenia, we earlier represent here. But the latest news I have, because my background is a criminal law here in the United States as a nurse. 
volunteer for Red Cross over the years. So I dropped the, all the cities, which is proves what's going on back home in Armenia against population with don't have a guns with a four-year-old kid who they kidnap already, which this is proof. I have the CD, I can prove it, whoever thinks it's not true. Parents are asked to pay money or take run from out of the country. That's my latest news. I went to Santa Monica headquarters of Red Cross, asked their assistance to interfere. They said they can't because corrupt government of Armenia told it's a terrorist act, which I don't think so, because in a small country where just a less than half a million people cannot just be a terrorist act when it's everybody under one belief. There is no other beliefs or any religions to interfere. But I ask you, Glendale of City, as a sister city of the Rapan, as we know previously we talked about it, Mr. Sinanian, I hope you're going to get more involved as a city because most of Armenians, as myself, we pay taxes to this country, which I'm really proud because give me the freedom of the speech. And I'm, I want my fellow Americans to know I'm not pressuring them, but as the country, the leader country who fights for a freedom of the people, especially the kids, my heart is broken right now because I'm shaking. I don't know what's going to happen with that four-year-old girl. As a mother of two, I'm really, I cannot ask the corrupt government. And um, myself, I already admit the IRS and the FBI fraud department because what is happening in a Beverly Hills area, my corrupt gov government money laundering, buying the houses, which us American citizen middle class wishing to own some small kind of a property for our future, but we can't. But the foreigner corrupt government kids, they come, they paid $11 million, $35 million, Houses, they buy it, they not even pay any tax to this country. They never work for this country. We have senior citizens who are suffering to survive in this economy, but somehow, homeland, corrupt government, Mr. Serge, kids, relatives, they use different names to get the property in the United States. So I did my part. I allowed them FBI fraud department to make sure they investigate that problem also. But as a citizen of Glendale, I really, I really going to be appreciated. I know you are mothers, some of you grandmothers, parents, just take any kind of actions, if you can, please. We will be appreciated as Armenians and as American citizens of this country. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Alakian. Next is Mary Bagdasarian. Mary Bagdasarian. Okay. We'll go to Aramanukian. Five minutes, please stay. Yeah, that's, the that's sufficient. It's probably even too much. Uh, good afternoon, City Council members, staff. Uh, as you know, my name is Ara Manugian, and I was here last week on Tuesday, Tuesday evening, to ask the City Council and the City of Glendale to take a stance and denounce the violence uh, that are being committed against the people of Armenia, um, and in, which had started or was triggered on July 17th. Uh, of this year. Um, as you know, we have uh, we had asked you on Tuesday to give us an answer by Thursday, which we didn't hear, and so we commenced in a hunger strike, which we've been on since Friday, um, and that's myself and there's one other person who's not feeling too well today because she was not as healthy as I was when she started. So it's been taking its toll on her, this hunger strike. Um, I would ask that the city council, again, and the city of Glendale do some soul searching. And I know I, I want to point out that uh, Zara Sinanyan has already started on his Facebook page taking a very uh, solid stance on the issue, which is going on, and denouncing what is going on, uh, as, it, as has uh, Artik Katsakhyan. And Again, I ask that all of you do some soul searching and hopefully you've done some research over the last week and have a better idea of what's going on and that the city of Glendale 
do stand by their sister city and take a stance, an official stance, and denounce what's going on. And as already had said, he's going so far as to making sure that his voice is heard by the authorities of Armenia, um, whether that be at the consulate or whether that be at a different level. So I encourage the same for you. The hunger strike will continue until our request from the city of Glendale is met. And hopefully that will happen today. And if it does, I'm sure that uh, our other hunger striker will be very happy. So she will be able to start to take in some food. Um, but I'm ready to go on for as long as I have to. As some of you know, in 19, uh, 2013, I went on a hunger strike for 24 days officially, which actually went for 26. So I'm ready to go the long haul if you guys are ready to go the long haul. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Morinkin. Andranik Dovlatin next. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Anikdovlatian. I've been a resident of the city of Glendale for a little while now, but always known this city. And uh, as far as the police brutality back home, I'd like to reiterate one thing. Um, my relationship with the Glendale Police Department goes further back than some of the council members who have been involved in the city, going back to a traditional police officer named Officer Barnes, who was one of our instructors in the Explorers Academy, who single-handedly uh, was the reason why I turned my back on a bad crowd and looked at the man and I said, that's, that's how I want to be. And, that, and he was the reason why I was pulled out of a lot of the element that I shouldn't have hung out with. So the Glendale Police Department has made a difference in my life directly, given me a, a direction, which then led to me joining the armed forces of these United States. And I would gladly serve again if this country calls upon me. And I'd also add, like to add one more thing as far as our police department. Thank you for showing up and protecting our freedom of speech, sir. There is no political influence, no campaign contributions of any elected officials or any of that that will ever stand between you and the admirable job that you do, sir. Job well done. I salute you for what you did yesterday. When you showed up, people got relief because we know the element that we're facing. We know what's hiding behind the cross which to me, having served as an acolyte and served in the Armenian church for over 19 years now, I am humiliated. And I stood at the gate and I said, I will not walk in there until I get a clear statement of what is going on with baby milk money that came to Armenia as humanitarian aid that has been laundered here in the United States. This is ludicrous. It's out, it's, it's, you can't put it in words. The European Union, I'd like to add one more thing really quickly, gives humanitarian aid and they explain and they break down in a very simple format of our high school journal entries and accounting and principles. And they put in this much money goes to pregnant women who can milk their babies so they'll have enough nutrition. Those mothers are hungry and breadless because the corrupt Ser Sarkisian police chief of Republic of Armenia that said had a face and audacity to stand next to our admirable officers and actually get advice. We welcomed that, finally thinking we will remove the old element of the Russian military doctrine and KGB connection of oppression and they will take some example from our fine officers. But what they did is they lied to our officers. The canisters that are supposed to be fired up this way, and I have police training, I have my, and I talk to a lot of cops, and I know how procedures are, sir. I've been around police work for a while, and, and I have friends who are cops. They're deliberately firing it on the ground and towards the crowds to, to instill burn on citizens. Children have lost their limbs, eyes. There's, there's photos and video upon video of citizens being attacked in their own home. And I'd like to deliver a message from the people of the Republic of Armenia to only the Armenian elected officials. And this is not a, uh, please, it sounds politically incorrect to these days when you say this only applies to the Irish or, or anyone else. But this is the message. Um, your silence, I'm very sorry to say, has been viewed as a betrayal to your own people, to a lot of your campaign promises and everything else. Mm -hmm. I understand there's a lot of big money floating around everywhere. But rest assured, in this country, these are the United States of America. No one will allow anyone to deny an American their freedom of speech and their constitutional right. Those rights are not going away. And I'm just delivering, and I will deliver preponderance to what I'm saying, 
as to how people view any Armenian in office. This includes Dashnak Revolutionary Organization, who've been major campaign contributors to a lot of Armenian elected officials, all the way to you people knowing state senators and state Supreme Court officials. Not one word for 15, 20 days of outright murder and neo-Stalinism oppressing my people. You should have stood until now and said something. As far as Arach Nortaran, church leadership, 30, 40, 50 million dollar constructions going on building church and fancy schmancy marble that my people bleed, process, and send to this country and the stone of my Armenia building churches, I will not walk in there until I know that church is clear of, 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 of this element of greed. And we will, I promise you, we will remove that greed. I will need help, but I will get it done. And I know I got help. I've got traditional. And let me add one more thing. I don't see any discomfort in dealing with someone who's got a Jewish name, Irish name, African name, or any of the other name. It no longer, at this point, gives me any sense of comfort to deal with a politician or elected officials, I'm done, that has an IAN or YAN. Okay. It doesn't matter to us. Thank you. Just demand our Thank freedom. Thank you, Mr. Dolatian. Thank you for listening. I salute you, sir. Thank so, you. Yes. before we take the next speaker, I speak for myself. So, to say that I've been silent on this issue is kind of not sincere. I'm being very generous right now. So. Next, uh, Christine Halajian. Uh, I'll, I'll wait until the... Yeah. It's okay. State your name for the record, five minutes. Good afternoon, uh, officials. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for hearing us. I'm here for two reasons. The first one, I'm here to show my appreciation to you, Ms. Sinanian, for your, uh, for your talk about this matter. I really appreciate that. Before we even start the hunger strike, you already gave your opinion about this, and we are very grateful for that. And the second reason that I'm here, I'm one of the person who was doing a uh, hunger strike. My name is Christine Halajan, and the second reason I'm here today is to show my disappointment. My disappointment to you, Mr. Najarian, and to you, Mr. Kerbetian. And thank you, Mr. Kasafian, for also expressing your opinion on your uh, Facebook page. We really appreciate that as well. Disappointment that I want to share with you is that you are claiming to be the human rights advocate. And I can't believe that it took you four plus days to come up with some kind of opinion. I feel that you're feeling helpless or scared. I don't know what is it behind your reasoning. I don't want to deal with that. It's just like I can't believe as a United States citizen who has the right for freedom of speech to take some kind of actions to stand up for any kind of human rights that's violated. It's you who are officials taking four plus days to come up with some kind of opinion on your social media or in a media. You know, if we are claiming to be something, we need to walk our talk. It's just not just words. We need to show it. And whole world already shows that what's really what's happening in Armenia. Even if it's not happening in Armenia, let's say in Africa, we as a human rights advocate need to stand up. Especially when it's your nationality, you have double reasons to stand up. But I stopped my hunger strike yesterday because I was having medical complications later on. My doctor advised me to stop immediately. But I can't believe that it took you four plus days. Even now, you didn't come up with some kind of, some kind of evaluation, evaluation about this, some kind of opinion, some kind of statement. And I'm not, because I'm a very optimistic person, I'm not giving up a hope that you will stand up. Just come up with some kind of statement. It can be today. It can be in front of everyone here in this, in this uh, hall watching you to come up and just condemn that police brutality done against humans, against Armenians, against kids who lost their eyes and got burned with four degree burns is just unacceptable as an official not to come up with some kind of statement. I'm just asking you just to do that today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Garbett, do you want to respond? Yes. Uh, 
I'd like to thank all of you for coming in <clears throat> today. Uh, again, just to say that we were silent on this issue is not a fair statement. Uh, I came back from Armenia, I don't know, about three weeks ago. I was on, uh, every one of us expressed our feelings and opinions in a different way. Some of us are not very savvy on the social media, and, uh, but I personally, my personal opinion, I was on three different shows, uh, the Armenian shows that it's on KVMD, some of them, and goes nationwide and worldwide, and I voiced my opinion on it. Maybe you haven't seen it, but it was on, on Barev TV as well as Paros TV, that in last three weeks, I came out three times and voiced my opinion about the issues that's going on. And what has to be done to me, I mean, as, as far as my own personal opinion as to what has to be done in, in Armenia. But overall, just to say that we were silent and we we're not saying anything, it's not fair. So, and there is many things that we can do. There are some things that we cannot do uh, sitting on this dais, and I think you need to understand that as well. But whatever has to be done, the right way, the legal way, the American way, we will do it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have Nanor Shaheen. Hello, my name is Nanur Shahin, and my voice is really bad. I apologize for that. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had to um, kind of lead the protest in front of church, um, and we were, not, uh, we were not allowed to use the microphone, so I had to scream for about three hours, uh, just asking for human right to... Um, just to acknowledge that this violence is happening in Armenia, and uh, even our own church is being silent. Um, so for those of you who do not have ideas, I guess I have a visual here. Um, all I want to ask you today is to make your decision. You have this right here, so you have to be either on the side of violence, that you can see the pictures, and I'm sure if you just search on Facebook even, or any you know, media these days, you can see all the pictures much better. This man in the middle who was, um, who was actually, he, he passed away this morning uh, because of the level of burn that he had. So I'm really upset today. Um, I'm very disappointed. I do understand that you as a person um, have your opinion, and I believe you shared your opinion, uh, but we're asking for much more than that. So I'm going to keep this short. I just wanted to be here today with this visual, and I'm going to leave it here just for you. Um, you either have to take the side of human right for peace in Armenia, or you can be on the side of violence. It's your choice, but we want, you, we want to know what's your choice. Um, I'm also here to announce that uh, I didn't eat anything today, and officially I'm joining uh, Oromanu Gyan for the hunger strike. Uh, straight, and um, I, we're just going to wait for an answer today. Uh, if there's no answer today, I'm just joining ARA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Shaheen. Yes, Mr. Nigerian. Well, let me make a few comments. First of all, uh, thank you for coming by. Uh, I don't think that any sort of violence from one side against the other uh, is to be tolerated in Armenia. I do want to say, however, that my efforts... Uh, in this matter are not going to be broadcast on Facebook. They're not going to be broadcast on TV. But I can assure you that I am taking efforts and taking steps towards conveying my sentiments towards the Armenian government, to the Armenian government. But I'm not going to put it on Facebook. So if, if, Ara, if you're looking for something on Facebook and say, this is who Ara met with, this is what Ara said, this is what the response was, you're not going to get that. And I don't think it's fair for you to impose on me your standards and your description of what I'm doing. But let me, uh, Ara, please. Let Ara. me tell you, Ara, please. that because you're an elected official doesn't mean you have to broadcast everything that you're doing. So let's be clear about that. And if that doesn't satisfy you, I'm sorry. But I can assure you that I am taking my own steps in my own way to do so. I'm sorry. Please, you, you said other what thing, you said. The other thing that I think is, is an issue that everyone is concerned about is the prospect of a civil war in Armenia at the moment, which will be a devastating event because we are for those who don't know, blockaded on all sides. We're struggling economically. The Turks and the Azeris, and some say the Russians, are waiting for any distraction, any diversion 
to continue their land grab in Karapah. None of us want that. But I can't say that I want the health, I want peace, I want to have a thriving Armenia and Karapah, and I want the young children to have something to look forward to, to remain in Armenia and to remain successful, strong Armenians. So, thank you. And um, I'm going to do a second call from Mary Bagdasarian. She's not here, I guess. So, comment. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to comment uh, um, to all of you. Thank you for coming back this week again. Uh, I want you to know that uh, last week after you visited City Council, uh, I did uh, um, get some uh, advice and had a letter drafted. Uh, we are now waiting. Uh, for um, uh, consultation or for a, um, a meeting with the State Department. Uh, it's not an easy task for us to simply send a letter. But as I understand it, tomorrow there will be a meeting, and, and we'll see where it goes from there. But there has been a letter drafted. Okay, thank you, Madam. Yes. Mr. Carpenter. We... We all been working on this on this letter, so we were told not to talk about this issue today, specifically because we're meeting with State Department tomorrow. So I just want you to know that this has been going on, this has been working on, and we were told not to talk about it today because just the fact that we are meeting with the State Department tomorrow, and tomorrow after the, the meeting, the decision would have made as to what kind of a letter, what kind of a language, but the statement was going to come out tomorrow. So. There are some things that we shouldn't say. There are some things that we can't say. So I just wanted to know that we are not ignoring the fact, and we've been working on this on this letter for for a week or so. And I'll conclude by I'm sorry, that's it. But uh, I'll conclude by saying that um, well, thank you for your activism. Thank you for um, your efforts. There are very specific limitations on on a city council. City council doesn't have any foreign uh, relations powers. We, we don't, we're not the State Department. We don't influence foreign countries. It so happens that we are of Armenian ethnicity, but Armenia is a different republic, so we have no jurisdiction there. The State Department is the proper uh, channel through which you influence or through which you apply pressure on a foreign government. Just a fact. I don't know that the city council will issue a statement or not, because I, I can't speak for the council. Um, whether they do or not, I, I want to once again, you know how I feel, but I want to once again call for the immediate release of David Sanasarian, Alek Yeni Gomshan, Hofsep Khurshudian, and Armen Martirosian, who are well-known political activists, peace-loving people, democracy-loving people. There's absolutely no excuse for their detention which now they've been detained for two months, from what I understand. Uh, in no country, no country that's associated with Glendale should have political prisoners. So whatever happens with the rest of the process, that's like an entire different universe. But, but these people need to be released today, now. That's all I have. So thank you. With that, we have, that was the last speaker. And uh, what's next on the agenda? Any authority member or staff comments? I think we made a bunch of comments today. No comments. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. And we're adjourned at 4.02 p.m.